Welcome to Nice and Blunt. My name is Adam Riancho, and these are going to be my week one wide receiver rankings. It's good to be back. Nice to get rolling at receiver. Yesterday, we did running back, so go ahead and check that out if that's the position you need to look at. But before we get into it, Hollywood Brown is out. He's not playing this week. I also don't expect Josh Downs to play. That feels very unlikely. However, DeAndre Hopkins, I did not rank in this video, is like a 50-50 call. We'll see if he practices, if he's good to go. They sound optimistic, but until I know for a fact I did not rank him, I will be updating these on Saturday. So make sure you're subscribed and ring the notification bell so that you don't miss out on that content. But with that in order, let us begin where I think number one is a pretty obvious rank. This week, I have Tyreek Hill versus Jacksonville as the top receiver. Last year in week one, he had 11 catches for 215 yards and two touchdowns against the Chargers. And you know that Tua is elite at home, especially in September. There are no concerns here. I see a kind of a blowout honestly, for the Dolphins. So give me Tyreek Hill at the top. And at number two, I'm going to put Justin Jefferson here right behind him. Are you really going to pretend like the Giants scare you? I'm not going to pretend that that's the case. And I don't think you should worry about Sam Darnold at all. Mullins averaged 380 passing yards per game last season in three full starts. And Jefferson stats did not change at all with Mullins compared to Cousins. So Mullins is the backup right now for a reason. I think Jefferson will still be elite with Darnold at quarterback. But number three, I'm going with Amon Ra St. Brown versus the Rams, who is literally the safest wide receiver that you can find. He is truly bust proof, but not quite the ceiling type of option that you're getting with the two players I have ranked above him. Not even really the ceiling of number four and five on this list either. But last year, he only had one game with less than 14 half PPR points. And this game is definitely going to be a shootout. I want a piece of it. Give me Amon Ross St. Brown at number three. Number four is probably the lowest rank I'll give you on CD Lamb all season long. But on the road at Cleveland, it's not the best matchup. And he also did not have a training camp that could lead to a rusty start in the first half. I'm not worried about it. I think by the time we hit halftime, he'll be perfectly fine and he'll probably put up like 100 yards in the second half alone. But I'm not going to pretend like the lack of practice time won't affect him at all. That's why I have him here at number four. He'll be back to wide receiver one in my ranks very soon. I had him at number one entering the season and I trust him throughout the year. But same kind of risk applies with Jamar Chase because he had no training camp either, and he's probably going to be a little rusty if he plays, but there's actually a scenario where he doesn't play at all, and this matchup is against the Patriots at home. The Bengals do not need Jamar Chase on the field in order to beat Jacoby Brissett. So there's no way that you can bench him if he does play, but I don't expect him to be the best player available at receiver and he actually could put up kind of a bad game if they're like leading by three touchdowns in the third quarter and he hasn't scored yet he might not really get that many snaps if they bench their starters in the fourth quarter so i'm actually a little worried about jamar in week one but not enough to actually bench him if he's on the field you have to start him so uh that's why he's at number five let's hope he is all right but number six i'm going with garrett wilson of the Jets on the road at San Francisco. We finally get to see his full potential with a healthy Aaron Rodgers. Let's hope we get more than four snaps this time. But San Francisco does have a good defense. However, the volume here is guaranteed. I expect Rodgers to probably try and pad his stats in what could be a potential shootout on Monday night. He's going to get the ball out quick, and Garrett Wilson is locked in for like at least 10 targets with Mike Williams not fully healthy off that ACL tear. I expect a massive workload for Garrett Wilson and a touchdown feels guaranteed. So I trust him 100%. And at number seven, I'm still going to start A.J. Brown versus the Packers. I understand he gets a tough matchup against Jair Alexander, but I don't give a shit. It is a new offense, though, with Kellen Moore as the new OC, Saquon Barkley also factoring in. But A.J. Brown is a must-start every single week. He is still the number one receiver they have, but maybe he's not their number one weapon overall. That's what he has been the last two years. It could possibly be Saquon 
this season. We will see. It is a neutral field in Brazil, and sometimes those overseas games are weird as fuck. It could be a massive shootout. It could also be a low-scoring game, and that's why I don't have A.J. Brown inside the top five. It's why I rank him behind Garrett Wilson this week. But number eight, I was not high on him entering the season. I ranked him as my wide receiver 20, but I actually have Devontae Adams here at number eight because it's on the road at the Chargers, and he owns this matchup. I have not enjoyed watching him face off against my Chargers since he's become a Raider. If we look at the last four games for Adams versus the Chargers, he's averaging 22.6 points per game on 13.5 targets per game, eight and a half catches per game, 124 yards per game, and four touchdowns. He is finding the end zone no matter what in this game. So I think he's a excellent play this week. He's definitely a top 10 option. However, I do view him as a great sell high trade candidate after this blow up game. I think he will be a lot worse the rest of the year. His age is a factor and he's going to be as healthy as he will be all season in week one. So um, try and chop him after he goes off, but you definitely want to start him against the Chargers this week. He owns this matchup. At number 9 and 10, I have Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua back-to-back on the road at Detroit. And this game is a lock to be a total shootout on Sunday night. McVay in week one also has an elite track record. I feel kind of foolish to bet that the Rams lose this game, honestly, but Puka is fine, but there is a preseason knee injury that is still looming in the back of your mind with Nakua, and that's why I think from a game plan standpoint, why not lean a little bit more heavily on Cooper Cup? It's not like Cup is a bad player. He has top five potential this season as a receiver in fantasy, and we mainly discounted him due to his long-term injury concerns. He's been hurt each of the last two seasons, but he's 100% healthy right now, and while I do prefer Puka uh, above him over the course of the season, I think in week one, give me Cooper Cup ranked one spot higher, but both of them are going to be elite options every single week. I don't think you can go wrong with either, but this week, I prefer Cooper Cup. At number 11, I have Mike Evans versus the Commanders, and last year, the Washington defense had the worst secondary in the league. They ranked last in the NFL, giving up 262 passing yards per game. I know they added Dan Quinn as the new head coach, and that's probably going to help the secondary a little bit, but in terms of talent, it is still shit, and Baker is obviously going to feed his favorite target and lead them to victory. So I think this week, Mike Evans is a must start. He is also a potential sell high trade candidate after a possible like 30 point game. He could put up massive numbers against an atrocious defense. So love Mike Evans this week. I also love T Higgins this week at home versus the Patriots without Jamar Chase in training camp. Higgins has the opportunity to enter the season with elite chemistry with Joe Burrow. So I think he's going to dominate the Patriots secondary as their top cornerback will obviously be more focused on Jamar Chase. That's the benefit of T Higgins all year long. He is capable of being a number one receiver, but he's always going to get the number two receiver treatment in terms of defensive attention. So love this matchup for him, especially with the concerns that Jamar Chase sits. Um, If that happens, you're getting at least 12 plus targets for T Higgins, pretty much guaranteed. And he probably sees 10 anyways incoming no matter what. So love T Higgins this week. He'll probably not be ranked this high as Jamar Chase gets more involved. But I think this week, especially T Higgins is a must start at number 13, right behind him. I have Nico Collins at the Colts, and we believe pretty confidently that Nico is the number one guy in Houston. They gave him that contract extension for a reason, but what exactly does the target share look like? We can't say with 100% certainty that it's like 12 targets a game. Like It could be 10, 9, and 8 for Nico Tankdale and Stefan Diggs, but no matter what, you're getting a lot of volume for the Texans best receiving option. And while week one does offer a bit of risk, it's nowhere near enough to bench any of these three players. I think betting on CJ Stroud keeps Nico in the top 15 every single week. I would be kind of shocked if he wasn't their number one receiver 
over the course of the season. So love him. His stats are going to be great this year, and you're definitely starting him in week one. Given the round two draft capital, you had to pay up. But number 14, I have Debo Samuel of the Niners versus the Jets. And because Ayuk missed training camp and likely draws the tougher matchup as well versus Sauce Gardner, I think Debo should be featured a little bit more on Monday night. He also usually takes it up a notch in primetime in general, and he does offer like 25 point upside any given week. So love Debo Samuel this week. I think he is the best Niners receiver to start week one. But right behind him at number 15, Marvin Harrison Jr. is absolutely a must start. Based on what you had to pay up in order to draft him, I don't think you're ever taking him out of your lineup. At Buffalo, though, it could be a slightly tough matchup. However, I think it's not enough to worry about. He was the most expensive rookie wide receiver in fantasy history, so I still expect him to live up to the hype. I mean, it would suck if he didn't, but it's his rookie debut. He might possibly start off a little bit slow, but I expect some garbage time to compensate for any hiccups we see for him in the first half. Hopefully he plays as advertised. I think he will. Number 16, though, I have Zay Flowers of the Ravens on the road at the Kansas City Chiefs, and he was dominant in the AFC Championship game versus Kansas City in January. He caught five receptions for 115 yards and a touchdown. He almost had two touchdowns, but unfortunately fumbled into the end zone. We all remember that mistake, but there is no Legereus Sneed in this game. He is no longer on the team. And I think Zay Flowers goes ham in a revenge rematch game. So with Andrews slightly banged up after his recent car accident, I think they lean a little extra heavily on on flowers and i think he goes over 100 yards and 100 percent scores a touchdown i picked the ravens to win the game i think flowers is a big reason why so 100 percent gonna start flowers this week and i'm 100 percent starting amari cooper versus dallas in a revenge game duran bland is out and trayvon diggs often gives up home run plays. So Cooper, while he only scored one touchdown in five games with Deshaun Watson last year, he also averaged 5.4 catches for 74 yards per game. And that is an automatic 10 point floor. I think he's a very safe option. He is bust proof in my opinion this week. And he also offers elite upside if Diggs does give up that house call. So in this revenge game spot, I think Amari Cooper is a must start and I definitely envision him finding pay dirt. I think he has a 25 point ceiling in week one. I think you have to start him, but number 18, I'm going with Jalen Waddle of the dolphins versus Jacksonville. Yes. He had a minor camp injury that is no longer a concern according to reports, but why I'm so confident is because Tua averaged over 300 passing yards per, per game last year in the months of September and October. And this is an at home week one game in September. The Dolphins could easily hang over 40 points on Jacksonville. There is too much upside to bench Waddle. I think he is a must start a top 20 play as well. Number 19, another wide receiver two. this time for Philly. I got Devante Smith versus Green Bay in Brazil. The overseas games can be weird as fuck, as I mentioned with AJ Brown, but there is definitely some shootout potential here with two juggernaut offenses, and AJ Brown also gets the Jair Alexander matchup, so maybe they let Saquon take over and they really lean on the run, but I don't worry about Devontae Smith's workload. I would trust Kellen Moore to still get him heavily involved, especially deep down the field. Devontae Smith can catch a 40-yard pass at any point in time. So there's always high upside with him, too much to bench. And with the potential shootout looming, I think he's a top 20 play this week. I'm definitely starting Devontae Smith probably every week. He's a top 20 option. But at number 20, I have Drake London of the Falcons versus Pittsburgh. And I think he will find his groove with Cousins eventually as the year goes on. But I got to be honest with you, week one could have some problems. I think it does carry some legitimate risk. But both Steelers cornerbacks are ranked outside the top 60 on PFF. I'm not that worried about Joey Porter Jr. completely shutting him down. It's not the worst matchup you could ask for. So I do think he puts up 
top 20 numbers, but this is really the test here. Are those preseason assumptions that he takes this massive leap, are they actually going to happen? They're going to be put to the test, and I do see a world where he does burn you. As someone who had Drake London on my team last year, he was a big disappointment, especially in the red zone. So it might be a good buy low trade opportunity if he does burn you in this game. I think it might take a few weeks for him to really unlock his ceiling, but late in the year, I love his playoff schedule. And that's why even if he does have a bad game, I'm not going to panic on Drake London right away. I, I do expect a kind of bumpy start from London. So I have him here at number 20. I had him as a top 15 guy entering the season, and I think it will work out. This week might be a little bit disappointing though. At number 20 though, I think you have to start him. Number 21, I have DJ Moore versus the Titans, and that contract extension really cemented his status as the number one wide receiver in Chicago, but the Titans acquired Legereus Sneed this offseason, and that matchup could pose a problem for DJ Moore's touchdown viability this week. But I'm going to trust the volume. I think Chicago comfortably wins this game, and DJ Moore probably finds the end zone in the process. I think he kicks off the season on the right foot. So I love his upside. I trust the floor. And at number 21, I think you're still starting DJ Moore. Number 22, though, I have Chris Olave of the New Orleans Saints. And you're probably thinking this ranking is pretty low for Olave, but this matchup is sneakily a bad one. The Panthers had a top three passing defense last year. They only allowed 171 passing yards per game. And compared to the league, that is a terrible spot. But JC Horn is also healthy, and that is a tough matchup as well. Olave in this divisional matchup has far better stats on the road as opposed to at home. When he plays on the road, he averages 15.5 points per game against the Panthers. Seven and a half catches per game for 117 yards, but no touchdowns. He has a very high floor. But compared to his stats at home, that is way, way better. He averages 12.7 points at home, which you're probably saying is like, that's still pretty good. But when you look a little closer, it's very touchdown dependent. His average stat line is 4.5 catches per game for only 44 yards per game with two touchdowns that completely saves those average uh, point totals. So I do worry about him. I think if he doesn't find the end zone, you are going to get burned with Olave this week. But if the averages continue, then he will score a touchdown in this matchup at home. So I think that's what you're praying for. I think based on where you drafted Olave, you kind of have to start him, but I'm genuinely wish wishing you some good luck here. I am honestly very worried about this ranking. I kind of feel like possibly 10 spots too high, but um, I think he's in the flex conversation at the worst. Olave doesn't feel like a guy you're benching, but Michael Pittman versus Houston comes in at number 23 in my ranks. It's not a great spot for him in his last four games versus the Texans. He's also only averaging 12.4 points per game, which is solid. It's not terrible, but the average stat line is also a little touchdown dependent. 6.3 catches per game for 63 yards per game with two touchdowns in those four matchups. But if you look a little closer at his entire career against Houston, he's only scored two total touchdowns in eight career games. So it is a gamble, also a little touchdown dependent, but I expect the Colts to actually win this game. I think it will turn into a shootout. And although Anthony Richardson is a bit of a wild card, I do think Pittman has some legit risk kind of every single week. I don't think he's as good as his preseason ADP would have suggested, but I do think he finds the end zone without it. He probably struggles to go over 10 points points, but I think this this game is very high scoring for Indianapolis, and I do think he finds the end zone. That's why I'm ranking him this high. I still trust him inside the top 25, but at number 24 and 25, I have Tank Dell and Stefan Diggs of Houston on the road at Indianapolis in the same game. I'm, I'll happily bet on Stroud every single week, but there is the risk of not knowing for sure what the target share will be between these three. Th uh, three collective wide receivers. I still think Tank is the number two guy in Houston, but Diggs is going to be right behind him, and there's 20-point upside with all three of these players every single week. I definitely prefer Nico Collins. I have him 12 spots higher than Diggs, but I think this game has shootout potential, and the Texans will need to score fast as they struggle to stop Jonathan Taylor and the clock. I'm firing up all three and letting the chips fall. I don't think you want to bench 
any of these Texans receivers almost like any single week until it's like clear. Oh yeah. One of them is not as involved as we expected, but um, fire them up. I don't think you can go wrong with any of them. Number 26 though, I have Terry McLaurin at Tampa Bay and we've kind of officially entered the flex conversation, but I think Terry's one of the safest flex plays you can find. The Buccaneers had a bottom four passing defense last year. They gave up 249 yards per game to opposing quarterbacks and Terry is in line for a massive target share week in, week out, especially with no more Jahan Dotson. It is a rookie quarterback making his debut, however, so I think tempering expectations is reasonable. I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit, but in this matchup, the ceiling is truly unlocked and the upside is too high to deny, so he's an excellent flex play in week one. I don't think you can go wrong with starting Terry McLaurin. Number 27, I have Rishi Rice versus Baltimore, who did not play well in the AFC Championship game versus the Ravens in January. He caught eight of nine targets, so high target share, but only for 46 yards, he did not score a touchdown, but without Hollywood Brown and a rookie making his debut alongside him, I do expect another big target share for Rasheed Rice. So you can't really bench him based on where you drafted him either. Let's hope his top 15 upside from last year flashes once again, but I do worry about this secondary. It is not the best matchup you could ask for. Speaking of a bad matchup, I have Brandon Ayuk far lower than I'm going to rank him rest of season here at number 28 versus the Jets. I would honestly understand benching him given the matchup versus Sauce Gardner. On top of the fact that he missed training camp and all of the noise surrounding him and his contract that he caused. But I am so committed to Ayuk this season. This is the lowest I can go in the rankings. Volume is a concern right out the gate, but he can also turn three catches into a hundred yards and a touchdown very easily. He is a massive deep threat and I am trusting him no matter what. That's why I think he is still a very legit high end flex play. But I understand if you want to fade him, if you don't trust him as much as I do, he might underperform. But if he does, I think he would be an excellent buy low trade target. And I still believe in his top 12 upside and value the rest of the season. I had him ranked as my number nine receiver coming into the year. And although this week might look uh, like I was dumb to make that call. I think as soon as week two, week three, you're going to get massive upside and a heavily involved player in this offense. Ayuk is the guy you want in the Niners offense this year, at least at receiver. I'm not going to pretend like he's more valuable than Christian McCaffrey, but week one might be a rough game against the Jets. They were the best secondary in the NFL last year, but number 29, I have Malik neighbors versus the Minnesota Vikings, and I get it. You probably think uh, this is a egregiously low ranking. He does have that weekly boom bust fantasy appeal, though, and that's why I'm nervous. I just I hate the quarterback situation. I I, I love his talent. Don't get me wrong. I've, I've mentioned this. I, I've had to defend myself on this take multiple times during the offseason, but there is always some shootout potential with these two bad defenses. However, the Vikings are obviously going to double team him on every single play. And that's probably going to be the case every single week, no matter who they're going up against uh, on the other side. So all he needs is one deep shot to the house to say, I told you so to the doubters. And that could definitely happen. That's why I still have him ranked in the top 30, but he's going to be this low in the ranks pretty much every single week. I think this is a very emblematic spot for my take on him. Like maybe he proves me wrong and the volume is just so high to ignore, but like there's going to be some massive dud games. And I think he's just a little too risky to like fully endorse as a top 20 player. So number 29, I think is the justified rank, especially in week one, we've never seen him legitimately in the regular season. So while I can't deny his talent, I can also not deny the risk. And at number 29, I don't think he's the safest play. I really don't. Number 30, I have DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks versus Denver. And the coaching staff loves him, but we've seen him get locked up in the past by elite corners. And he's got a matchup in this one against Patrick Sertan, who is legitimately one of the best corners in the NFL. In this exact matchup, in week one, two years ago, the only time that he's ever faced PS2, DK Metcalf caught 
all seven of his targets. You would expect that to be a very high game for him, but he only put up 36 yards on those seven catches. He did not find the end zone either. He was pretty dog shit. He barely gave you seven points in that game. So I think there's massive boom bust potential in this spot. He could absolutely burn you. I don't think it's a terrible decision to bench him, but I don't think you can because the upside is also way too high to ignore. But it's the first game with these rookie coaches and it could possibly be rough. I called an upset. I took the, the Broncos to win this game and we're going to find out how that works out. If Metcalf uh, proves me wrong, I might look very foolish with this wide receiver 30 ranking. Some of you probably think he should be closer to number 15. We're going to find out. We're going to see, but I hate the matchup. I can't pretend like I don't. Number 31, I have Chris Godwin versus Washington, who only caught two touchdowns last year while Mike Evans caught 13. So he's due for positive regression, especially as he returns into the slot. And I think he's a very safe option this week because it's an excellent matchup versus Washington, the league's worst secondary last season. So the target share keeps his floor very high every single week, but betting on the touchdown to hit is still a risky proposition. This is the matchup though, where it should happen. And that's why I think he's a very legit high-end flex play at number 31. I'd like to put him in my lineup. Number 32, I got Christian Kirk of the Jags on the road at Miami. And I see a massive lead for the Dolphins in this game. So game script will force the Jaguars to pass a lot in this one. But coming off an injury with two new wide receiver weapons in this offense, he probably sees a lot of defensive attention. And assuming we know the target share definitively favors him right off the right out the gate is a gamble. So he is a very safe play over the last two seasons. He's averaged at least 11 points per game in two straight years now. And even without a touchdown, I do think that is his floor this week. I think 10 to 11 half PPR points is guaranteed, but I'm a little worried he doesn't score a touchdown. Last year in week one, he was actually atrocious. He nearly put up a bagel. So uh, I don't think that's the risk that's involved, I think he's very safe from a floor standpoint, but I'm not convinced he finds the end zone. I think there will be a lot of attention and defensive focus on Christian Kirk. So just a floor play, but definitely in the flex conversation, you could do far worse than Christian Kirk. And number 33 is a risky bet. Honestly, I have George Pickens here on the road at Atlanta. And while yes, there is absolutely no target kip competition whatsoever, especially with Jalen Warren banged up at the moment, but you could say that about Drake London last year with Arthur Smith, and that didn't work out for fantasy either. He was barely ever relevant inside the top 30. So Pickens can go off for 25 points any given week. I don't want to pretend like that's not possible, but he can also burn you for less than five points any week. And how lucky do you really feel in week one when we've never seen Russell Wilson and this offense together? So I get it if you want to bench him, but Russ is also a big upgrade over Desmond Ritter. So to compare pick and situation to the Falcons last year is not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison. So it's always possible that George Pickens turns into Cortland Sutton in the red zone this year. If that happens, we're in line for the top 25 player I did rank entering the season. I still believe that Pickens is very valuable, but this is not best ball. You have to trust him, and it does feel rather risky. I think his value will be going up when Justin Fields is inevitably the quarterback, in my opinion. But if you're swinging for the fence in your flex spot, Pickens is a great option to do that with. I wish you luck. I hope it works out, but I kind of want to see it before I fully endorse him inside the top 25. Number 34, though, is Calvin Ridley at Chicago. And there is a world where DeAndre Hopkins does play, and that would probably lead me to lower him in the ranks. But I really don't like this matchup for him. PFF ranks Jalen Johnson as the league's number one cornerback last season. And you know he's going to be draped all over Ridley in this matchup. So assuming Hopkins is out, yeah, you can probably get like 10 plus targets for Ridley, but you're also going to get 
bracketed coverage and one of those guys is the league's number one top cornerback so I really just hate this matchup for him I'd rather just stay away if I can but the volume keeps his floor high however I do not think he scores a touchdown this week I think they put a lot of focus on stopping Ridley and especially in the red zone I do not see him getting open that easily so I am trying to pass on Ridley I think he's barely a low-end flex play he's not going to crack open the ceiling in this tough matchup against Chicago but at 35 and 36 I have Jaden Reed and Christian Watson of the Bears back to back uh against Philly in Brazil the Eagles secondary was absolute trash last season they ranked 31st allowing 253 passing yards per game so I think Jordan Love is probably going to go off in this game and Reed was the Packers leading receiver last year he also scored 10 total touchdowns so he is by far the safest bet to have the most fantasy value among the four Packers receivers but with Watson healthy at the moment his ceiling does come down significantly and if Dontavian Wicks actually mixes in at a similar rate to the other three guys we could have a very capped risky bet on all four every single week so we'll know a lot more about this rotation after a few weeks i think this week is um, gonna show us a lot but also because it's in brazil not really going to definitively give us the most clarity we could hope for and it's really just never a guarantee that we're starting the right packers receiver until we see someone clearly emerge as the alpha so yes i do think Jaden reed's floor is very high the upside for him is also way too high to ignore in this offense but you knew that there was risk when you drafted him it's not best ball so i hope you choose correctly and that's why i can only rank him here at number 35 it is a gamble at the end of the day and if you're gambling why not just bet on the most talented most athletic receiver of them all in this offense the same narrative applies with christian watson you could easily pick the wrong packers receiver any given week but no one is faster no one has more upside of the four packers options he's healthy at the moment and if you look at his last 16 healthy games with Green Bay, Watson has scored 13 touchdowns. So now is the time to start him. He does offer that 25 point upside any given week. And we also know that he can get injured at any time as well. So it's risk reward. While you know that he's healthy, why not put him in your lineup? I'm tempted to rank him above Jaden Reed straight up, but they did draft some young corners on the opposite side of the ball. I'm not actually worried about them but Darius Slay probably lines up against Christian Watson and he's the guy that worries you the most but he's 33 years old there's no way he can match the speed that Watson has and that's why I think if you're taking a swing why not go with Christian Watson he has some of the highest upside of any receiver in the NFL I think this is my cutoff point though for the flex options moving forward I think you'd rather fade them and keep them on the bench but at 37 I might be way too low on Jordan Addison Addison has massive upside in this offense I am a believer in Sam Darnold I understand that most people are not but say what you want he will throw some egregiously ugly interceptions this season but if Nick Mullins can average 380 passing yards per game in this offense last year then Darnold can throw for over 300 yards consistently as well the suspension for Addison is not going to come until after his court date which occurs during the week six bye so you're at least getting five games where you know Addison is going to be involved and TJ Hawkinson is on the pup list so right now is the time to start him we know that the Giants will have to focus heavily on Jefferson all game long so Addison has a lot of upside as well as a high floor I think he's seeing at least eight targets in this matchup it's just a question of will Darnold actually live up to my expectations until I see it that's why I'm not going to rank Addison top 30 but I think if you drafted him now is the time where you're trying to start him his upside will never be higher but I understand if your depth at the position is just too good to fit him in in the starting lineup I want to rank him higher but at 37 it sounds like I'm not expecting a great game from him from him I think if he doesn't score a touchdown though you're still probably getting like eight or nine points with the touchdown you might get 16 plus so decent decent bet I don't think it's a, a bad option but um a little bit risky given we've never seen Darnold on the field in Minnesota 
ever before. But moving forward at number 38, I have uh, Deontay Johnson of the Panthers at New Orleans. And last year we saw Adam Thielen start off red hot at an elite rate, but it is a new offense altogether. It's not guaranteed to translate to the same immediate value for Deontay. They traded for him though, and he's clearly their number one wide receiver. So he is a pretty safe bet. I could see him getting 10 plus targets this week and it wouldn't shock me at all, but he also gets a matchup against Marshawn Lattimore on the opposite side. And that's a tough spot. He could also easily be held to three catches for 40 yards even on 11 targets. And if he doesn't find the end zone, that would be atrocious. So I will pump the brakes. I think it's easy to assume he has a safe floor, but I'd much rather just wait and see before fully trusting him in my starting lineup. Bryce Young could also still look like shit. So I'm going to keep him on the bench, but inside the top 40, he's not a bad bet. I think a floor of at least seven or eight points is probably guaranteed for Deontay Johnson. The, the ceiling is also there. I get it if you think I'm too low. But number 39, I have Brian Thomas Jr. at Miami. And similar to Christian Kirk, I think he benefits from a very good game script in a potential Miami blowout win. But I love his talent. He has tremendous upside with house call ability from anywhere. He scored 17 touchdowns last year for LSU. So he's a massive, massive swing for the fence, but to assume he is immediately the Calvin Ridley replacement that I am expecting long-term would be a bit naive until we see it. It is not that safe. And I love his value long-term. I am going to rank him above Christian Kirk at some point this season. I think he overtakes Kirk by week six as their number one guy, but Evan Ingram is still there along with Gabe Davis. It could be a very spread out target share this week with possibly a rough intro to the NFL. So he is a little risky. The upside is just undeniable, however, and that's why I have him inside the top 40. Jacksonville will need to throw it deep, and he's probably their best guy in terms of athleticism. So he looked excellent in the preseason when given the opportunity. It's just a matter of time before I start ranking him top 30. If you watch my channel this offseason, you know I love Brian Thomas Jr. He's one of my favorite players this year. But number 40, another rookie wide receiver that is a little risky to fully bet on. It's Xavier Worthy versus Baltimore at home. Hollywood Brown is out for at least two weeks, so the rookie has a shot to make a name for himself right away. We know he has the speed, but he could also get pushed around in press man coverage. That was a concern for him in training camp. And to expect a massive rookie debut does not feel very safe, but it's not impossible, especially when you play for Andy Reid with Mahomes at quarterback and you have 4-2 speed, anything can happen. Watch him do nothing for like three quarters and then take a screen pass to the house from 50 yards out in the fourth quarter to seal the game for Kansas City. So uh, I don't think it's a terrible decision to bet on him. It's just... Uh, you're ignoring the risk if you tell me like he's a lock to put up 20 points this week and um, starting him is going to be very tempting every single week. But I'm not going to be surprised if the Chiefs also spread it around so much that he gives you like six or eight games this year with less than three points. I think he's a massive gamble. And while the upside is too high to ignore, I think the risk is also too high to fully endorse. But at the moment, He's way more valuable than he'll be like in week five or six because Hollywood Brown is out and I get it if you want to take that swing, but it's a little bit too, uh, too indulgent for me to endorse week one. Number 41 and 42 though, I have Ladd McConkey and Josh Palmer of the Chargers versus Las Vegas at home. And even if you're not a Chargers fan, this should be one of the most interesting offenses to watch in week one, because without any insight from the preseason, we really have no idea what to expect with Justin Herbert under center. Everyone thinks these two will outright suck, but they still play with Herbert, an elite quarterback who throws one of the best deep balls in the league. And although it's a run first offense, it's not like they're never going to throw the ball at all. And yes, the Raiders do have some very good corners, so it might look ugly in week one, but with no one you actually trust behind them on the depth chart, volume could carry both guys to very high floors week in, week out. I think they're better options in full PPR 
than half PPR. But I prefer McConkey straight up. He's faster. He has the draft capital at the top of the second round, and he also has the higher ceiling rest of season. But Josh Palmer is more established and a very good floor play. He might be the guy that you want to start the year because of his chemistry already established with Herbert. And the fact that Herbert missed the preseason doesn't help McConkey's development right out the gate. But both guys could possibly see like eight or 10 targets this week, and they could be the number one waiver claims at the position heading into week two. If either is available on the waiver wire, I think you should pick them up now for free before the price inevitably goes up. Palmer went undrafted in over 60% of leagues on ESPN, and I think he's one of the best stashes before the season kicks off. I would pick him up before it's too late. Number 43, though, I have JSN, Jackson Smith, and Jigba versus Denver. And according to Tyler Lockett, it looks like he's going to play, but he's also 32 years old. It's not a guarantee, and he's already dealing with a leg injury. So even if he does suit up, I think um, JSN could be in a very good spot to step up here. Metcalf also has a terrible matchup against Patrick Sertan, and I really want to rank JSN higher. But until I know for sure that Lockett does not suit up, then I'm not going to do it. There was never really elite production from JSN last season to really guarantee that he hits his ceiling right out the gate. I like this offense. I like their upside over the course of the season. But in week one, it's a true gamble. And I would have put him top 40 if Lockett was out. But that is not the case, at least at the moment. So JSN could genuinely burn you and look like a terrible decision to endorse week one. So I only have him here at number 43. I'm not convinced that Lockett fully gives up his number two role in this offense yet. And that's why I think he's more of a bench stash at the moment, not the best flex play in week one. But um, good luck. I think JSN will offer some value long term this season. Right behind him, though, back-to-back -back in the Bears' offense, I got Roma Dunze at 44 and Keenan Allen at 45 versus Tennessee. And just like the Chargers receivers, I think this is one of the most compelling battles for me to watch as well. Keenan is coming off an elite season, but at 32 years old with some weight concerns in camp, how long is it going to take before the rookie ninth overall pick overtakes him? My over-under for that bet, is Halloween, but I genuinely think it could happen as early as this week. And with Sneed lining up against DJ Moore, we could see Rome explode for multiple touchdowns. I really want to start multiple Bears receivers, to be honest with you, because I think Caleb is going off against what was a pretty mediocre secondary last season. But until we get more clarity on the exact snap allocation between Keenan and Rome, I think it's just too risky to bet on. I really want to rank Rome higher. But if you're surprised I have Odunze above Keenan straight up, then it's because you haven't been watching the channel this offseason. I have repeatedly told you on the live stream and in the rankings videos, give me Rome far above Keenan. I think he's definitely the better option. There is no injury concern at all with Rome. Meanwhile, Keenan has missed 12 games over the last two years, and he's 32 years old. It's going to take Shane Waldron physically removing Rome's helmet mid-game and sitting him down on the bench for me to change my mind. Give me Rome 100% over Keenan Allen, at least over the course of the season. I might be wrong about it in week one. I'll at least acknowledge that. But uh, moving forward, I think you're really playing with fire if you start any of these guys, but especially in DFS, I think they are very interesting gambles. And Romeo Dobbs at Philly is the perfect example of a gamble. You never know for sure that you're starting the right Packers receiver, but Dobbs could actually have the most value of them all this year. He put up the best stats in the playoffs when all four were healthy, and he also scored eight touchdowns last season. Jordan Love has an excellent connection with him in terms of straight up friendship. So he might look like the steal of the draft if all of a sudden we look back in week four and we're like, holy shit, Romeo Dobbs is the clear alpha in this offense, but we could also see him be a complete bust if this four-man rotation filters in everyone at an equal rate, and I do think he needs to stay on the bench, at least at the moment. He also was not heavily rostered coming out of the draft, so I would also think about picking him up off of the waiver wire right now if he's available. He's probably as cheap as he'll ever be, and he could go off 
and look like a steal next week. But number 47, I have Demarcus Robinson of the Rams at Detroit. And we all know this game is a shootout. And while Jordan Whittington looked good in the preseason, the Rams rested their starters and Robinson is still the clear number three wide receiver to start the season. In his last five regular season games with Stafford at quarterback, he scored four touchdowns and could find pay dirt again. He's not a bad contrarian play in DFS at all for a very cheap price. I think he's an interesting dart throw, but I will mention the fact that he only caught three of six targets for 44 yards and no touchdown in the wild card game versus the Lions back last January. And there's always risk this late in the ranks. I get it if you have no interest in Demarcus Robinson. But in the same game, I have Jamison Williams of the Lions versus the Rams. And Jamison is the definition of risk in fantasy. He could get you two targets and turn one of them into a 50 yard touchdown. He could also get six plus targets and not catch a single one. So the range of outcomes is probably the widest of any player in the ranks, at least at wide receiver this season. But in a guaranteed shootout on Sunday night, why not take a shot on him if you're looking for a high ceiling desperation dart throw. The last time we saw him, he scored two touchdowns against San Francisco. One of them was a rushing touchdown from over 40 yards out, and that was in the NFC Championship game. With Josh Reynolds gone in this offense, we might see a big target share for Jamison Williams if they do decide to limit Jameer Gibbs a little bit after that lingering hamstrings injury. But um, according to reports, Jameer Gibbs is 100%, and that's why I'm not like fully ready to uh, bet on that. This is definitely bench territory in my rankings, but JMO has so much speed. He's at least someone I'm willing to roster on the bench with hopes that he could break out. I spent a dollar on him in the subscriber league auction draft, and I don't think that was the worst investment to make. I'm interested in stashing him for a while and see what he can do. But uh, next up, I have Khalil Shakir versus Arizona. The Bills have a massive amount of targets up for grabs this season, and the Cardinals had an atrocious defense last year. I don't think they're much better. They're far worse against the run than the pass, but Josh Allen can exploit them in all facets of the game uh, no matter what. So with Curtis Samuel's turf toe injury limiting him uh, significantly and Keon Coleman making his rookie debut. I think that Khalil Shakir will get the second most targets of anyone in this offense behind Dalton Kincaid in week one, but I'm not confident enough to start a bills receiver until we get a clear picture of how they're going to be used. But if I'm desperate enough that I have to start one of them, give me Shakir over all the others out the gate at number 50 though, I have Cortland Sutton at Seattle, and he should put up good numbers. You would at least expect that from a number one wide receiver, but he was just so touchdown dependent last year for me to truly feel confident with him every single week. He barely saw 80 targets last year, and although I do like Bo Nix and think Denver does win the game, I just can't envision he scores 10 touchdowns again this season, and if he doesn't find the end zone, you're going to be lucky to get like eight points from Sutton, so I also think he gets a terrible matchup against Devon Witherspoon. PFF ranked Witherspoon as the number six NFL corner so terrible matchup here and I think he's much more in line to bust this this Sunday than put up like 15 points so I want to see it first with Sutton and Knicks together before I commit to starting him in my lineup but at this point in the rankings you could do far far worse you're pretty desperate if you're considering Sutton but moving forward I'm just going to rip through these next 10 guys I think it's very unlikely you start them but I do want to mention them just for the sake of the record but number 51 I got Gabe Davis at Miami and at this point I'm swinging for upside with Brian Thomas making his rookie debut we could see Davis get some deep shots in catch-up mode you know he's either giving you 20 points or a bagel though so good luck number 52 I have Rashid Shahid versus Carolina and it's a bad matchup for Olave I think Shahid could get some good volume this week he's not a safe option though but a 60-yard house call is always in the cards it is possible given his speed. At number 53, I have Jerry Judy versus Dallas, and Deron Bland is out, and Amari Cooper and David Njoku are going to demand enough attention for Judy to get open in this game. They traded for him and paid him 17 mil per year. I could see Stefanski getting him involved just to show the fans that they were right to bet on him despite a disappointing career up to this point. It was kind of a questionable trade, albeit they didn't give up 
that much to get him. But number 54, I have Jacoby Myers of the Raiders at the Chargers, and Bowers has been on the injury report lately, so maybe this is one of the few games this year where Jacoby Myers is actually their number two target. I do not trust him enough, though. I've been pretty low on Jacoby all off season. Number 55, I got AD Mitchell versus the Texans. And speaking of number two targets, I do not trust. Now would be the time where AD Mitchell has the clearest path to success with Josh Downs unavailable, but without a touchdown, you are screwed. But I think the Colts play very well in this game. So I actually think he's a very sneaky upside play in week one. I don't think the touchdown is that unreasonable to bet on. Number 56, I got Darnell Mooney versus Pittsburgh, and I will forever be a believer that Darnell Mooney is underrated. But week one versus Pittsburgh is probably not the safest spot to trust him in a new offense that we've never seen play together. But at least we know he will play a majority of snaps for Atlanta this year, and that does offer some value at number 56 not elite value, but 57. I have Michael Wilson of the Cardinals at Buffalo. And if Marvin Harrison is going to struggle at all this season, it would be to start his NFL career in week one. So if they do have to lean on Wilson, now is the most likely time for that to happen. You know, the Cardinals will have some garbage time in this game as well. So it's possible that Michael Wilson tears up the Bills secondary as they ease back into prevent defense in the second half, he could score a random touchdown in the fourth quarter if the score gets out of hand. But number 58, a risky play this week is Brandon Cooks at Cleveland, and he's had a sore knee since mid-August, and at 31 years old, that's not encouraging. But Lamb could be rusty, especially in the first half, without much uh, reps in the preseason, and he's still in line to be the number two receiver in Dallas to start the year. I understand if you prefer Jalen Tolbert, but at the moment, I still think Cooks is the safer play. And last year, he also scored eight touchdowns. It's possible that he scores another touchdown again in week one, but the volume is going to max out at like six targets from a volume safety net standpoint. Cooks is not a very good bet. So he's hyper touchdown dependent. I'd rather pass and just bet on Jake Ferguson if I'm starting a second Cowboys receiver. But number 59, I got Dontavian Wicks at Philly in Brazil. And yes, this does feel very risky, but he's the most talented wide receiver four in the NFL. And he will get on the field a decent amount this season, but you can't say for sure how much he has house call ability though. And he might play so well to start the year that he demands consistent snaps all year long. I wish it wasn't so crowded in the Packers offense because I actually like Wicks a lot from a talent standpoint, but he has massive potential. That's why I got him top 60. But the last player I will mention in this video is Mike Williams of the Jets at San Francisco. And I know he hasn't been fully healthy long enough to have an elite rapport with Aaron Rodgers, but he's healthy at the moment. And he also has the same boom bust value as guys like Gabe Davis and Rashid Shaheed. If things go right for him, he might be a consistent top 40 wide receiver by Halloween in the rankings. He's a, at least talented enough for that to be within the range of outcomes. But in week one, it feels far too risky to bet on. I'm going to pass, but maybe pick him up off of waivers if available, he could be a steal and potential league winner. But these are my top 40 wide receiver rankings this week. I think once you exit the top 36 after Christian Watson, I think it's a little bit too risky to bet on. But honestly, there's some really tempting guys even outside that range, like especially Jordan Addison, Brian Thomas, Lad McConkey, and Palmer. Like, oh shit. That's very tempting. Like even Odunze and Xavier Worthy, I want to put in my lineup. But until we see it, for sure, it's not a safe bet. It's definitely a gamble. And I think the guys you're really trying to count on would be the top 32 all the way until Christian Kirk. I think those are the guys you can at least expect like 10 points from, almost guaranteed. And some of them do have bad matchups, but the talent is too good to ignore. You usually want to start more receivers in terms of tiebreakers at the flex spot. So I'm in love with the top 17 i think all the way through amari cooper you're getting massive massive gains from these guys but everyone through terry mclaurin stefan diggs i think are like elite wide receiver twos one of the best flex options you can find overall but um receivers really deep as always and it's hard to go wrong if you have anyone in the top 40 you're usually getting double digit fantasy points so it's a very interesting week we're going to learn a lot and i cannot wait 
And that's going to be it for this video. But my name is Adam Riancho, and I hope you enjoyed. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel for more content, and I will see you next time in the next video. Thank you for watching. Nice and blunt.